Hello and welcome to the MVP listening session. My name is Bethany Yeo and I am the Acting Director of the Planning and Community Development Department here in East Long Meadow. On behalf of the East Long Meadow MVP team, I want to personally thank you for taking the time to join us at this virtual public listening session to learn about the town's involvement in the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness or MVP program and to share your ideas about climate adaptation in East Long Meadow. Our MVP process was kicked off by our planning and economic development team, including our former planning director, our planning board, and myself, who have been working over the past nine months to bring together local voices in a conversation about reducing East Lang Meadows' vulnerability to the impacts of climate change. We selected the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to help us through the process. And before I turn it over to Catherine Rate from PVPC to lead us through the first part of our presentation, I want to comment briefly about the webinar. Hosting and attending community meetings online is a new territory for most of us. This session today is being recorded so all residents who might not have been able to watch it today will be able to participate. Please stay tuned at the end of our presentation for details on how you can join the discussion on social media through an online survey or by contacting one of the project team members directly. If you want to comment after the presentation, please write your comments into the chat box and we will address them after the presentation. The neat, uh, so I'm Catherine Ratte. I work at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission as, as Bethany said, and um, I'm very excited that you're all here and that you've committed to this work. The need to increase planning for and implementation of climate resilience and adaptation activities is strikingly evident in the Pioneer Valley and the town of East Longmeadow is taking note. No stranger to extreme weather events, East Long Meadows staff, emergency responders, and residents have begun to expect roadway flooding, downed trees and tree limbs, and power outages on at least a yearly basis. These and similar events in nearby communities have reinforced the urgency for climate adaptation and compelled municipalities like East Long Meadow to proactively plan and mitigate potential risks through a community-driven process. The Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant Program, MVP, provides support for cities and towns in Massachusetts to begin the process of planning for climate change resiliency and implementing priority projects. The Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs awards communities with funding to complete vulnerability assessments and develop action-oriented resiliency plans. Communities who complete the MVP planning program become certified as MVP communities and are eligible to apply for the MVP action grants and other opportunities to support climate adaptation at the local and regional scale. So what is climate adaptation? Adaptation, adapting to life in a changing climate, involves adjusting to actual and expected anticipated future climate changes. It is doing what we can to live with and minimize the destruction and suffering that comes from climate change, especially when we know that the worst climate impacts affect vulnerable populations such as older adults and our economically disadvantaged neighbors. We need to build our homes and our businesses and our infrastructure so that it can handle the stronger storms and the floods on the horizon. An example of this action is right-sizing culverts to handle increased intensity rainfall events. The other thing we need to do to make East Long Meadow less vulnerable is mitigation. Mitigation, when applied to our changing climate, involves reducing the flow of heat trapping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. In other words, it's addressing the root cause of the problem and adaptation is dealing with its effects. Recognizing the importance of both mitigation and adaptation strategies to deal with our changing climate, East Long Meadow applied for and received an MVP planning grant. The principles of the MVP program are all about recognizing the power and the strength of municipalities. It's about generating ideas from the bottom up, building on local partnerships, relationships, and other strengths to reduce vulnerabilities to climate change. As an MVP planning grant recipient, the town had to meet a number of requirements, the most significant of which was holding an eight hour community resilience building workshop at which municipal officials, local stakeholders, and decision makers came together to look at climate projections, complete an assessment of the town's vulnerability, 
and developed action-oriented resilience and adaptation strategies. At the workshop, staff from the Commonwealth, the um, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, encouraged the municipality to consider actions that incorporate principles of nature-based solutions, those that could be used as pilot projects for other communities to emulate, and of course, those that reduce risks faced by environmental justice communities. Now that the town is wrapping up the MVP planning process, it will receive the designation as an MVP community, helping it to compete for other state grant programs and funding opportunities. As we've mentioned, the most closely related funding stream is the MVP Action Grant, which is available to only MVP certified communities and which can award up to $2 million per year and up to $4 million for regional projects. These grants do require a 25% match, and it can be both in kind, the staff that's already paid by the municipal budget or volunteers, as well as a contribution of municipal resources. The MVP program is unique in that it provides dedicated funding for implementation and it incentivizes nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions enhance and work with natural habitats to help people adapt to the effects of change and disasters while slowing warming and protecting nature. They provide co-benefits for people and the natural environment, and they can lead to great projects that address adaptation and mitigation. Some examples of nature-based solutions are shown in this image. They show bioswales at the East Hampton High School Bioswales are channels designed to concentrate and convey stormwater runoff while removing debris and pollution so it doesn't clog or go into storm drains. Let's take a few minutes to dive into our problem. In 2013, atmospheric CO2 levels exceeded 400 parts per million, higher than any time in human history, using 800,000 years of ice core data. This has had dramatic impacts on global temperatures. Worldwide, each of the last three decades have been increasingly warmer than the previous. 20 of the hottest years on record have occurred in the past 22 years, and the last five years were the hottest ever. Bringing all of this closer to home, a February 2020 report from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration showed that the first two months of meteorological winter which is December 2019 and January 2020, were the warmest on record for the contiguous United States. Here in the Connecticut River Basin, we see these changes and their impacts almost every day. New statewide projections tell us with more certainty than ever that these changes can be expected to continue. By the end of this century, East Long Meadow could see more than seven inches of additional rainfall per year compared to a baseline of 46.4 inches per year recorded in 2000. Rainfall is expected to increase in spring and winter months in particular. The winter season is expected to experience the greatest seasonal increase both in total precipitation and the frequency of heavy downpours or days receiving precipitation over one inch. Spoiler alert, we also know that our air temperature is getting warmer Understanding that both winter precipitation and winter temperatures could increase in future decades, we can expect more of this precipitation to fall as rain instead of snow. There are all sorts of human and environmental impacts that could result from this change, including reduced snow cover for winter recreation and tourism, less spring snow melt to replenish aquifers, higher levels of winter stormwater runoff, and lower spring river flows for aquatic ecosystems. Projections also tell us that summers may be drier and that we will see more series of days without any rain at all. This could lead to drought, putting pressure on agriculture and natural ecosystems. And we can expect to see four more days per year with rainfall over an inch. We are already seeing what these projections look like in real time. One of the most pronounced changes in climate in the Northeast, more than any region of the United States during the past several decades, 
has been a 71% increase in the frequency of extreme precipitation events since the mid 1990s. This graph shows annual maximum 24 hour precipitation from the Amherst weather station, the one closest to us. It shows a major change in the trend line since the 1960s with the highest 24 hour rainfall event recorded within the last few years nearing seven and a half inches. These are the types of storms that cause flooding, erosion, and pollutant runoff from agricultural activities. More inland flooding will happen as soils become saturated and stop absorbing more water. We're gonna see rises in creek and river flows, and we could see the, the failure of our stormwater systems if they get overwhelmed. Moving to temperatures. You may have heard that the annual average temperatures are rising around the globe, and here at home too. Projections show us that we will see more of an increase in winter temperatures than in other seasons. Even a very small rise in average temperatures can cause major changes in other factors, including impacts on species and ecosystem health and the relative proportion of precipitation that falls as rain or snow, which we just talked about. When we put our climate adaptation hats on, we generally think about cold weather in terms of the need for heating shelters and concern about winter storms knocking out power. These concerns don't necessarily change with fewer days below freezing. However, this trend may indicate an increase in the frequency of the freeze frost cycle, something that we have seen in recent years, and it wreaks havoc on highway departments as it leads to monster potholes and increased maintenance needs. We also see increased annual costs for anti-icing measures due to midwinter thawing and freezing rain. Furthermore, fewer days below freezing can impact the life cycle of certain insects with subsequent transmission and outbreaks of disease like West Nile virus, Triple E, Lyme disease, and others. So how will these warming trends influence our warmer seasons? Annual average temperatures will continue to rise. And beyond this general warming trend, the change that may impact people in East Longmeadow the most is the increase in very hot days. Many of us, some of us, don't have air conditioning, and this could be a serious problem, especially for older, vulnerable adults. This graph shows projections for extreme heat, or the number of 90 degree days we experience each year. The model looked at daily maximum temperatures over 90 degrees, 95 degrees, and 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Generally, extreme heat is considered to be over 90 degrees Fahrenheit because at temperatures above that threshold, heat-related illnesses and mortality show a marked increase. The 1971 to 2000 baseline is six days per year over 90 in the Connecticut River Basin. Here we are in 2020, and temperatures recorded at the Barnes Municipal Airport in Westfield hit 90 degrees 10 times in July 2019 alone. We'll see some of these really hot days in the fall, but most will occur in the summer. Why is this important? heat waves, they can lead to death, to death, illness, especially among older adults, and the very young, people who are economically disadvantaged, people who work outdoors, and individuals with pre-existing health conditions. Wrapping up these climate projections, we expect to see an increase in the frequency and magnitude of extreme weather. This could come in the form of tropical storms, or other high intensity wind and rain events. And here too, we'll see the greatest changes in the spring and winter. Now that you've got the background context of the data, I'm gonna turn it over to Corinne Meisey Muntz, my colleague at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission who will walk you through the workshop. Thank you, Catherine. So this review of what we can expect from climate change in the future leads us back to the recognition of our challenges today. To summarize what Catherine was saying, some of the more daunting climate challenges before us are more extreme storm events and precipitation, more extreme heat, warmer, wetter winters, and more summer drought. These challenges will impact some individuals more than others. We need to be especially careful to include those vulnerable populations in our considerations and planning for reducing vulnerability. Social factors such as age, race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status can increase vulnerabilities to the impacts of climate change. 
These factors can increase exposure to dangerous environmental conditions and or make it more difficult for individuals to take precautions or access help before, after, and during extreme events. One way to think about this is that climate change is a threat multiplier. In other words, all of the challenges of daily life are amplified by the impacts of climate change. MVP workshop participants were asked to consider how the climate impacts we've just discussed will have ramifications for those already experiencing inequities. They were also presented with a summary of existing environmental and infrastructural challenges in East Long Meadow that could be exacerbated by climate change. The following snapshot of concerns and challenges identified by town officials and workshop stakeholders isn't meant to be a comprehensive list but provides a helpful framework from which we can begin to brainstorm potential solutions. One of the vulnerabilities that participants in East Long Meadows workshop identified was the increase in stormwater and stormwater related flooding. The town already has identified two problem culverts and called for a comprehensive inventory of existing culverts. The DPW superintendent reported on stormwater related flooding at center athletic fields and also at the Pioneer Circle area in the northeast section of town. We also heard that some buildings, such as the town hall and residential homes, uh, basements flood seasonally. Next slide. In, ad oh, excuse me. In addition to stormwater related flooding, natural resources were identified as experiencing some vulnerabilities in East Long Meadow. These include food systems, which not only pertains to local farmland, which we'll discuss in a moment, but also transportation networks and the continued operations of local businesses in case of an emergency so that residents can continue to access emergency food supplies and regular groceries. Invasive species and habitat shift were also identified as vulnerabilities. Invasive species can include insect species such as emerald ash borer or gypsy moth, which can wreak havoc on our tree ecosystems. Um, and also potentially damage personal property. And it can also include um, an increase in vector-borne diseases due to the changing habitat or um, introduction of invasive insects, such as uh, different types of mosquitoes and ticks. Loss of open space and farmland to development um, is tangential to food systems and was identified as its own vulnerability to East Long Meadow and the surrounding region, both as it affects town character and also local economics and um, the viability of the local food system. The built environment had its own challenges as identified by workshop participants, and these include older and energy inefficient housing stock, which strains the budgets of those who live in them, but also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions due to energy inefficiency, and also a lack of affordable housing, which as you can see in the graphic to the lower right-hand corner, affects both renters and homeowners alike. Next slide, please, Catherine. In addition to equipment and infrastructure challenges, workshop participants noted a need to increase education about and signups of the existing emergency communication system um, which was at the time of the workshop rave, but the town has recently switched to Spark 911, which is also a reverse 911 system that distributes information to all residents who sign up for alerts. However, it's important to note that the system can only help those residents who know about it and who have already signed up. And participants affirms, workshop participants a need, uh, affirms the need to make sure it is as easy as possible to sign up for this service, including including the sign up information on the town website. And if you haven't already signed up for Smart 911, you are now able to do so through the town website. So please do go ahead. Participants also expressed concern over possible social isolation for people living alone, experiencing English language barriers, and or living in poverty. And these and the need to conduct more outreach to these groups when preparing for a winter storm or other emergency that can result in power outages. Next slide. Electricity is one of the most critical pieces of infrastructure in modern societies, and the electrical service outages in East Long Meadow can be caused and exacerbated by the hazards prioritized during the MVP process. One stakeholder suggested that East Long Meadow is at the end of National Grid's line, so when the main line is compromised in a neighboring community, East Long Meadow is likely to also be affected. 
Workshop participants identified the need to research and understand how battery storage capacity for electricity generated from renewable resources, such as solar, can enhance East Long Meadows resilience. The specific issues identified within East Long Meadows roadway network were twofold, infrastructure maintenance and culvert functionality. Road passability is important for residents who may need to evacuate or travel in the case of an emergency, and it was noted that the town includes many roadways with only one access point, which, should they ever be blocked by flood or debris, could trap residents. Undersized culverts and storm sewer systems contribute to local street flooding on Elm and North Main Streets. Reducing vulnerability to climate change is not just about the challenges we face, but also the tools we have to deal with these challenges. Workshop participants were quick to point out East Long Meadows' strengths in responding to the previously identified challenges. These strengths and assets are important because they help increase our resiliency to hazards and climate change and can be the building blocks of adaptation. It's important that these assets are safeguarded so that they continue to serve as strengths well into the future. For East Long Meadow, let's just leave this slide up for 30 seconds so that people can read through. Now let's shift our minds back to the MVP planning grant. In order to meet the first three objectives of the MVP planning grant shown on an earlier slide and repeated here, the town held their MVP workshop in November 2019. Approximately 14 participants from the boards and committees of the town, community organizations, and other interest groups, along with residents and landowners, attended the workshop, which included a combination of large group presentations and small group activities. Pioneer Valley Planning Commission began the workshop with a presentation outlining the workshop process and goals, updating participants on past and ongoing local planning efforts, and presenting a new state-provided climate projection data to enable both decision support and risk visualization. Participants then broke out into three small groups and over the course of the workshop assumed different participatory roles and responsibilities to engage in a rich dialogue and share ideas and experiences. The idea is that by bringing together a diverse group of thoughtful leaders and decision makers in the community, we'd be able to generate more and better ideas than any of us independently can come up with on our own. The next part of our presentation will include a summary of the top priority climate adaptation projects that the workshop participants came up with. Workshop participants identified more than 50 actions that the Town of East Long Meadow, in collaboration with neighboring municipalities, regional partners, and state agencies, should take to improve climate resilience um, to climate change impacts. Towards the end of the workshop, participants selected their highest priority actions from the 50 plus that were developed during the workshop. The selected actions were then grouped together into the following eight highest priority actions, which these workshop participants will talked about. At the end of the presentation, we will ask you, our audience members, to weigh in on the top priority projects and to tell how, how you would add your voice to the conversation, even though we're all convening from different times and places, and we'll give you information on how to provide your feedback as well. So we have, I, the group identified eight of the, of the 50 plus projects, as Corinne said, they are not ranked amongst the eight. We're just listing them off in a, in a random order. The, the, the first of the eight um, is to update based on new climate data and municipal experience, the existing town-wide inventory and condition assessment of culverts, and then prioritize the maintenance, repair, and replacement for future investment and upgrade to the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative Standards. And again, the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Standards are those that would allow appropriate passage of, of aquatic life, but also would accommodate the predicted um, level of weather that we just talked about. And then um, at the same time, researching and understanding how nature-based solutions such as rain gardens and permeable pavement could be integrated into these new upgraded culverts to reduce the strength and volume of water that's entering and in, into them and passing through them improving their functionality, and then possibly mitigating some expensive replacements. 
A second priority action is to conduct a townwide inventory of public trees, identifying those in need of maintenance or removal given the new pests and diseases affecting trees due to the climate crisis and our changing temperatures. Create a community resilient tree management plan and seek funding to implement the plan, possibly in collaboration with surrounding communities. Also, it was suggested that the municipality should work to identify new climate appropriate trees for various uses in the community and educate people and organizations about these new trees. A third priority action is to conduct a housing needs assessment and or to secure funding for a master plan that would include a housing chapter with the goal of assuring a variety of housing choices for the aging population of the community that may need or want to downsize, but still stay in East Longmeadow, while also emphasizing the need for energy efficient construction, prioritizing electricity for heating because the Commonwealth has pledged to decarbonize the electrical grid and use rene renewables for energy generation. A fourth priority action is to research and understand the town's vulnerability to extended power outages and work with National Grid and the Commonwealth and key businesses such as Big Y to improve the resiliency of the electrical grid by researching the utility of clean energy generated microgrid and or distributed generation systems for a subset of criti critical buildings and services in the extent of extended power outages, expanding backup power and improving maintenance. The town of Palmer and Big Y have been exploring a microgrid, so this is something that could be learned from, our, from neighbors within the region. A fifth priority action is to conduct a townwide drinking water study to identify all the threats to the water supply, especially those caused or exacerbated by the climate crisis, and articulate actions needed to protect and maintain the town's water supply and access to clean, fresh water into the future. A sixth priority is what we mentioned earlier. We want to, the town wants to conduct an outreach and communication campaign to make sure that 100% of residents are signed up for SMART 911. If you're listening to this now, you can go to the website and sign up. We really encourage everybody to do it. We want to get 100% participation. This way you can take advantage of the opportunity to communicate with all town residents about the actions the town is taking to build resilience and to nurture and to support people's feelings of belonging in the community by signing up for reverse 911, smart 911, sign up now. A seventh priority action is to conduct energy efficiency audits and improvements on the town hall and other municipal buildings. First, you can, by requesting no cost energy efficiency audits available from the utilities, implementing all the subsidized work possible to reduce energy use, and then research the feasibility of installing solar power or other renewable energy sources combined with battery storage. The eighth priority recommendation is to collaborate with the Department of Conservation and Recreation and the Office of Dam Safety to secure funding to conduct a dam removal study for Jawbuck Dam and conduct outreach to owners of privately owned dams to understand the safety and maintenance concerns related. Now I'm going to turn it back to Bethany to wrap things up. Thank you, Catherine. Our next Steps are as follows. Step one, collect public feedback through June 1st. This can be done via our online survey, which will be made available shortly and will be accessible on the East Long Meadow website. For assistance filling out the survey or accessing other So um, you can also send comments directly to Bethany or myself. Um, and you can get Bethany's contact information on the town website. You can send them to me at C-R-A-T-T-E at pvpc.org. Um, the town will then be finalizing the summary of findings report, submitting it to the Commonwealth for approval. And then again, the final action is to be able to apply for a future MVP action grant. Are you there, Bethany? Yep. Sorry. Okay. Um, to learn more about MVP, you can check out these links provided in this, this slide. And that includes our presentation of this listening session. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to myself. And I want to thank the PVPC staff for all their assistance through this process. Thank you all very much. <laughs>